Salut, cher téléspectateur. Well, um, someone requested that I make a video about the French withdrawal from Algeria. So I'm about to do just that. <clears throat> so Algeria is a North African country. It's bounded by the Mediterranean Sea to the north, has the Atlas Mountains not far in from that. Uh, to its west, it's got Morocco and the Western Sahara. Some people regard that as part of Morocco. To the east, it's got Tunisia and Libya. To the south, it's got um, Mali. And uh, did I forget another one country it's got? Mauritania. So that's that. So um, the northern part near the coast of the mountains is, is, is somewhat fertile. South of that, it's quite, um, quite uh, arid. Well, it's a desert. Le Grand Ergue and so on. Just sandy desert, hardly even any rocks. So um, it's a Muslim country. The people are Sunni Muslims almost without exception these days. Um, there were Christians there in the early days. There were Jewish people there as well. But anyway, it was part of various Muslim empires. By 1830, it was nominally part of the Ottoman Empire. So the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire was the titular ruler of Algeria. And though he never went there, there was the Day of Algiers. Day, not as in daytime, but D-E-Y. It's, it's, it's a title, as in like ruler. The Day of Algiers was the man, in, man ruling Algeria. There's a city of Algiers, and as it comes from al Jazeera, as in the island in Arabic just on, on the northern coast, but that city gave its name to the whole country. Though he didn't have that much control deep into the desert, but there's very little control where the Bedouin were wandering around. Um, anyway, so there'd been Barbary pirates along that coast for centuries, and their depredations on shipping and on coastal towns of Europe had obviously infuriated Europeans over time and fought against them. Obviously, European pirates had uh, attacked people from North Africa as well. But anyway, um, the French were looking to expand, uh, so, but in 1830, the French ambassador was in, in Algiers, and I can't remember what contretemps there was between himself and the day of Algiers, but the day of Algiers hit him across the face with a fly whisk. And because of this, the French took this as their pretext for invasion. So they invaded and conquered Algeria. They had superior military technology. The Ottoman Empire didn't go to war against them because of this. Now, first of all, they only penetrated the coast, but hello there, Diane Malloy. But uh, over time, they, they got um, deeper and deeper into the country, further and further south. They confiscated some land from the local people, the more fertile land, and they began moving in settlers. So um, the two um, indigenous languages of, of Algeria are Arabic and Berber. There are at least three dialects of Berber. And um, most people are illiterate. That was that. There'd been a Jewish community there for centuries. So it, was quite, it was quite small. Um, and so the so French um, immigrants came and they settled mainly along the coast, some cities, and they were even the majority in a couple of cities. Then people came from other European countries, such as Spain, Italy, Germany, uh, even Malta, and they became French citizens, became French-speaking, and that was that. And their identity was just sublimated into that of the French, um, and they were intermarried. So these people, these immigrants, were known as les pieds noirs, as in black feet, I suppose because their feet were in Africa, even though they came from, from Europe. So they were French citizens, and the, the Algerians were not. Um, but anyway, it was, de it was developed to be the French started building railways and using, building their, using their modern architecture to build things and running water and so on, eventually gas and electricity. Um, so there were some improvements in life and in agriculture. Often um, they were growing um, uh, vineyards, uh, well, their grapes turning into wine. The Muslims didn't like too much. So it was kind of near the twain shall meet. There were a very few Algerian Muslims who started to learn French, became fluent in that, but their French citizenship was not available to them. Some, a few of them benefited from the whole system, but they largely kept themselves to themselves, practicing the traditional way of life. Um, so Algeria was, was um, uh, legislated by the French National Assembly to be a part of metropolitan France, not a colony. And indeed, the French citizens there were elected people to the National Assembly, so it was represented therefore, but only the French citizens who were, who were a minority. At most, French citizens were 20% of the population. Um, then um, remember that France had a state religion until 1904, which was Catholicism. So if you wanted to become a naturalized French citizen, you had to be a Catholic, unless you're born in metropolitan France. Then in the late 19th century, they passed a law and they said that the um, Algerian Jewish community is, is nationalized en bloc. They all get French citizenship, even though they're not converted to um, Christianity. In the late 19th century, it was a very popular and fashionable place for um, wealthy people to go on holiday. It's the Mediterranean, of course. Oscar Wilde went there, for example, um, and that's that. There was a bit of a gay subculture to it because 
um, sometimes these, these wealthy European gays were having liaisons with um, impoverished Algerian youths. I'm not sure if Wilde did that when he was there. Um, so many French people said, well, you know, this is just uh, southern France. It doesn't matter where the southern shore of the Mediterranean, the northern shore, it's still France. It really felt like France to some of them. Perhaps some of these um, French settlers may not have even been aware they were in such a small minority. Famously, Albert Camus um, lived there, the, the author and communist. All right, so um, then after 1904, um, uh, Algerian Muslims were allowed to become citizens, so very few of them did. You had to be fluent in French, um, written French, and some that didn't want to. But um, also they were recruited for the army, fighting the First World War. They could only be volunteers unless they're citizens. Citizens were conscripted. Those who are not citizens could volunteer and getting, getting little recognition. Um, so uh, then came uh, the Second World War. Won't tell you the whole story, but anyway, June 1940, France surrendered and there was Vichy France. This is a new, is, is new history to me. No intelligent questions to ask. All right, Diane. Well, listen and learn. So... Um, uh, Marshal uh, Henri Philippe Pétain was ruling France, the, the, the chief of state. That was his title, not president, not prime minister. And um, okay, he was in Paris most of the time, but obviously northern France and the Atlantic coast of France was under German occupation. The rest of France, the southeast, was Vichy France, with its headquarters at Vichy. That's why it's called Vichy France. And the people who support it are called Vichy Viste. The people from the city of Vichy are Vichy -Wah. And they get very annoyed if people accidentally call them Vichy Viste. But anyway, um, so France was allowed to retain her colonies, including Algeria. And um, the French fleet was at uh, Marcel Cabillo. There's this notorious incident then in July 1940, when um, the Royal Navy was ordered by Churchill to issue an ultimatum to the French fleet at Marcel Cabillo, saying, you either have, you can, you're going to give you a number of options. You can scuttle your ships, or you can come and sail with us and join the Free French Navy, because a few French ships had refused to surrender to Germany and sailed to the United Kingdom to carry on the fight. Or um, you can um, sail to the United States and um, just go into internment, because as a neutral country, the United States will seize your ships, impound them, you'll have to stay there for the rest of the war, so you can't take part in the war. Um, now, you're gonna have to answer us um, within, within a certain time period, like two hours, or we're gonna attack. And they didn't answer in two hours, so the attack went ahead, and um, uh, the Royal Navy, they bombarded these ships, they used planes to bomb them. Over a thousand French sailors were killed, some of them f falling into the water, which was burning with oil, just burnt alive. Um, and not a single British sailor was killed. So, um, as you can imagine, it's a toxic issue in Franco-British relations. France was at peace, it was a neutral country, it wasn't harming the United Kingdom, and here, as they saw, was this unprovoked attack on them. Oh, terrible, indeed. Winston Churchill said that was the most agonizing decision he took in the whole of the war. Do you do this or do you not? Okay, the French fleet was fairly formidable and the argument was he couldn't risk this falling into the hands of Germany, otherwise its uh, naval might would not be much less than that of the Royal Navy. Um, the, the, the Vichy Beast might be ordered by the Germans to hand over their ships or even their sailors. Some of them might volunteer to do it for various inducements. They felt badly let down by the British who'd left them in the lurch at Dunkirk and things like that. So uh, that was that. So. Um, very dangerous not to do it. Was it a breach of international law? Was it an inhumane thing to do? Some people said that. Um, so uh, then he went into the House of Commons and he found himself, to his astonishment, cheered to the echo. He'd shown how determined he was, that he was very serious about fighting on to the bitter end. He'd shown the Vichy French that obviously if they collaborated with Germany, they were going to pay a very high price indeed. Because some of them might have thought that, um, that cooperating with the Third Reich was a cost-free option. Um, Anyway, uh, sorry, what was this? The Second World War, was 1940, is after um, uh, France uh, was obliged to surrender to Germany and much of the French fleet was at Merzel Kabir in Algeria. Now, the commander of the French fleet there was Admiral Darlan, and Darlan was obviously incensed that so many of his sailors had been killed and his ships sent to Davy Jones's bottom. Yes, the Second World War. But uh, he was then made a governor of Algeria. Um, anyway, so it won't go through the whole thing. Um, but there's Operation Torch in November 1942, the Allied landings in North Africa, mainly Morocco, some in Algeria. And um, the idea was to use as little force as possible to the French, uh, on the French forces there and persuade them to surrender and change sides. And that largely worked. So the US military arriving there, it was thought to be a relatively easy operation because the US Army had suddenly expanded very rapidly. And a lot of these American soldiers were greenhorns, had no combat experience, been rushed through training. 
uh, a simple operation and it worked. It was a real morale booster for them. They'd obviously got Morocco, they got Algeria, and so therefore, say, British shipping through the Mediterranean was much safer because of that. Um, and um, Darlin was persuaded to change sides. So he, um, he turned his coat very quickly. Wonderful for the Allies. But some people say, wait a second, this guy's a Vichy feast, or he's a fascist, we shouldn't be doing this. And in order to induce him to come over to the Allied side, they were told, and you can remain as governor of Algeria. So he said, yeah, fine, I will. But this, this begged other questions. Now the Allies, their, their, their um, attitude was unconditional surrender. They were gonna insist on the, on the, the uh, Axis powers surrendering without any um, proviso saying, we'll surrender on condition we can keep our territories before the war or something. We'll surrender on condition there are no reparations, or perhaps we'll surrender on condition there are no war crimes trial, something like that. If you're gonna allow Dalan to remain on post, how about Mussolini? How about the Italian prime minister? If he says, okay, I'll surrender or even change sides, but I have to stay as leader of Italy, would you agree to that? That's a bit more difficult. And they're slightly worried. The Western allies think that Stalin doesn't trust us. Stalin thinks we're going to make a deal with Germany, a separate peace, leave him to fight on. Then he might actually make a deal with Germany before we do, because he doesn't want to be on his own. If we'll say, okay, we'll accept Germany giving up and Hitler can stay as leader of Germany. Are you going to accept that? But what if that saved lives? What if that saved millions of lives? Shouldn't you do that? Anyway, so back to Admiral Dahar. But just a few days later, a French uh, royalist assassinated him. Uh, he was very quickly arrested and, and um, guillotined this young man. The Allies said, well, actually, we didn't plan it. There was this theory going around that the Allies had Dahar assassinated because they found it embarrassing to leave him as governor of Algeria. But actually, for them, it was serendipitous. Um, OK, so the... U.S. military was there and so on, and the um, autochthonous people of Algeria largely stayed out of this fight, which is almost entirely on the coast. There was a little bit of fighting. Um, so fast forward to the second, end of the Second World War. Right after um, the surrender of the Third Reich, um, some Algerians went and killed about 100 French civilians in Algeria. I'm not quite sure why, so it was an anti-colonial thing. And then um, some French settlers were incensed and said, we're going to hit them back. So these enraged Frenchmen went and killed 10,000 Algerian civilians just a, a few days later. Um, so it's, it's a story which is very little known about in the Western world. 10,000 civilians butchered. Uh, what the hell? Yeah, exactly. You heard me right. So uh, obviously relations between the two communities have got off uh, to a very bad start right after the Second World War. Um, but anyway, the situation w was soon calmed down, it was fairly tranquil, but uh, France was say, facing all sorts of problems in its colonies. It granted uh, independence to Lebanon and Algeria almost immediately after the Second World War. It had largely lost control of them. Um, and in Madagascar, there was a fairly large rebellion, which was put down with great force. And then Indochina, Indochina is what we now call Vietnam, um, Laos, Cambodia. Anyway, um, a rebellion started, I won't tell you the whole story there. Um, Ho Chi Minh led it. Um, and the Viet Minh, he said he was first and foremost a nationalist, a communist, second of all. But anyway, France attempted to re-establish control in, um, in Vietnam and never really succeeded. So 1954, the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Um, so the, France was, it was heavily defeated. And after that, the, the Evian Peace Accords, France recognized Vietnamese independence and withdrew. That was that. But obviously this was, this was um, followed very carefully by Algerian nationalists. And by this stage, the Algerian upper class and the Algerian bourgeoisie, they uh, were literate in French. A lot of the um, Algerian working class couldn't speak French. So many of them couldn't even speak, uh, sorry, couldn't even read Arabic. But anyway, so intellectuals knew what was going on and they um, took heart from this, said, well, what the Vietnamese are, we are doing, we ought to emulate. We don't want to be ruled by France. We, the majority of people, we have no representation in the French National Assembly. These are the laws, not, laws that we, not the laws that we want. Uh, a century ago, land was confiscated from us without compensation and given to these uh, French immigrants. And the French don't respect our religion or our language and so on. The official language here is, is uh, Arabic, is, sorry, is, is French, which is ludicrous. In order to be Arabic or possibly Berber, the language of the majority is the official language of any country, right? Therefore, it's grossly unfair that French should be the official language. So we're disadvantaged because we don't speak that as our mother tongue, it's more difficult for us to succeed in education, to get all sorts of jobs. Um, so we don't like the, the conceited attitude of the French immigrants uh, lording over us. They despise us. Vietnam, I remember the draft, hippies, all that 60s stuff. 
Well, obviously, France was fighting there to retain control of their colony till 1954. When I say France, it wasn't just people from France itself, or it wasn't just white Frenchmen. They had people from, say, what's now the Central African Republic or Senegal um, fighting for them, some pro-French Vietnamese as well. Anyway, um, the FLN was f f formed Le Front Libération Nationale, the National Liberation Front, the FLN. So uh, perhaps it's curiously, it's known by its French name, not its Arabic language name. 1954, I was born. I never would have guessed. I was born uh, somewhat after that, as you may have deduced. Anyway, Ahmed Ben Bella was one of the most um, famous figures in the FLN, and it was part of a wider movement of African nationalism. There was stirring as a bit in the Gold Coast. That's now what we call Ghana. In Kenya, there was the Mau Mau Rebellion against the British colonial authorities. Um, and uh, they had the blessing of the communist world. Remember, the Soviet Union was at the height of its power then. Um, and uh, so many Muslims also backed them up. So uh, they'd seen the growth of Arab nationalism, like in Egypt, General Gamal Abdel Nasser had come to power and so on. Anyway, so the, the fighting hotted up. They, they, it, was, it was really a guerrilla campaign by the FLN. They didn't have heavy weapons. They didn't have tanks or planes or artillery. So doing a lot of hit and run in the mountains, in the desert, but then into the urban areas. And many cities have a kasba, which is like a labyrinth of lanes and built up very high. The French army had to go in there, search house by house, use informers, arrest suspects. Torch was used on a very wide scale. And there were uh, lots of uh, massacres on both sides. So it's horrific. You should see the film about it by Ponte Corvo called The Battle for Algiers, which came out only a few years later. And some of the people starring it actually play themselves. Um, and so FLN people who were caught, they were often uh, executed by guillotine. The Minister for Justice at the time was um, François Mitterrand, who was later president. And, and he signed off on many of these um, executions. Ali Alapoint um, is another figure in that film, of a character in that film. So try to be as realistic as possible. Yeah, watch that one. Obviously, it's in French and Arabic, but English subtitles. I can't remember which um, American general had people watch it saying, well, it tells you how to win this conflict but lose the peace. Um, so, yeah, Marxists around the world um, backed them up. Even the FLN wasn't Marxist itself. The few communists in Algeria also backed it up. The FLN was a secular organization, as in, okay, its, it's, its members were Muslim almost without exception, but they weren't particularly trying to promote an Islamist ad agenda. They're mostly urban liberal people. McNamara, no much after that, some American general involved in Iraq. Remember Robert McNamara? He was obviously defense secretary at the time of Vietnam. Um, so, uh, Anyway, setting off bombs to kill members of the French community. And so some Frenchmen found the Organisation de l'Armée Secrète, OAS, the um, secret army organization, and they began setting off bombs in ethnically Algerian areas to kill Algerian civilians. Um, so I think it was Massou was the um, French uh, parachute general brought in to try and sort the situation out. So the, it was a very unchivalrous conflict on both sides, as you can see. Now, Jacques Chirac, later president of France, he was a young conscript fighting there. Um, so it was horrific. I never heard of this. Thank you, George. So damn interesting. I'm glad you find it intriguing. But so, um, so that was that. So France was, was mired in this conflict and it was costing an awful lot of money. France's name was mud in the Muslim world. It was detested by most communist countries because of this. Partly, you know, France, the United Kingdom and Israel, they all attacked Egypt in 1956 for reasons I won't go into. So the Algerians, they were getting vocal support from other um, Arab and Muslim countries. They're getting money, arms, FLN, Carders going abroad to be trained in Tunisia and Algeria, notably. And remember, in 1956, both Algeria and Tunisia became independent. Um, so then come, these, these, these men go abroad for military training, come back into Algeria and fighting. So uh, what's going to happen? You know, France had been through like 20 years of war almost. Uh, 1939, the Second World War began right up to sort of 1958, still going on. What's going to happen? And they were, they were suffering serious inflation. Um, they, weren't, they weren't that prosperous for a Western country. Uh, then um, they, they, they was almost a coup d'etat, a military coup. Some of the um, parachute regiment in, in, in uh, Algeria thinking of flying to Paris and trying to overthrow the government. So there's a constitutional crisis. This was the Fourth Republic. So they said, they, they said let's have a new constitution, the Fifth Republic. Um, or, uh, we're going to have a president, we're going to have a prime minister, more extensive powers of the president. And de Gaulle, remember General Charles de Gaulle, who'd been chairman of the, the French Committee of National Liberation in the Second World War and been president of France, 1944 to 46, had retired to his um, natal village of Colombie les deux églises and he's persuaded to come back out of retirement. It's not that sunny now, maybe I'm okay, and, and become president, and so he did. 
And would you, would you vote for him? So he stood for the presidency and he won handily. And they say even communists voted for him, though he's a conservative, because they thought he's the man to save France. So it's 1958, he came back as president. Um, and so he went out to Algeria to assess the situation and he addressed the Les Pieds Noirs and he famously said, Je vous ai compris, I've un understood you, which uh, they took to mean, well, um, he's, he agrees with us, he's going to fight on till absolute victory, crush the FLN and keep Algeria as part of France forever. But really he saw this was costing too many lives, it was too expensive, and it was really damaging France's reputation around the world. It was simply unwinnable at any sort of price that France was willing to, to pay. And therefore the only sensible thing to do was to just recognize reality and uh, say, okay, the Algerians can have independence. So that is eventually um, what they did. Um, so um, tra transition to that, even though they achieved some more success against the FLN. Now, of course, uh, the uh, Le Pieux Noir were incensed when they heard that. The OAS tried to assassinate him. You should see The Day of the Jackal, that Frederick's Forsyth film. Well, it's based on Forsyth's novel about the OAS hiring a, a hitman to try and bump him off. So, um, 1962, France withdraws from Algeria. Le Pierre Noir, as in the French settlers, they almost all leave. They're also Arki. Arki are Algerians who were pro-French and some of them left, moved to France. Those who remained behind were butchered. Tens of thousands of them were killed. And de Gaulle said, I don't give a damn. So that was that. So Algeria became an independent republic. Now, almost every erstwhile French colony has French as one of its official languages. Algeria does not. Arabic is the only official language of Algeria. Uh, think of a deaf, of a conservative is very different of your definition of political parties. Okay, well, de Gaulle, he was certainly anti-communist, he believed in capitalism. Yes, there should be free trade, people allowed to own property, set up businesses, make profits. Um, he wasn't anti-religious, he wasn't particularly religious himself, a nominal Christian. Um, what, what else would conservative be? He wasn't especially into feminism, though he did grant women the right to vote in France in 1944, which they didn't have beforehand. Um, he was part of NATO, uh, so that's fairly conservative. What would conservative mean to you? Um, uh, he'd wanted to keep the French colonies. He later realized that that was um, just um, uh, just not viable. Um, anyway, so he remained president until 1969. He died in 1970. Um, so that was, a, that was a, the French withdrawal from, from um, uh, Algeria. And Les Pieds Noirs, when they came back to metropolitan France, they mostly settled, settled in southern France on La Côte d'Azur. Um, because it wasn't that far from, from Algeria, going to ports like Set, um, the, the, the climate was a little bit similar. Sometimes they've come from that region of France some generations earlier, um, and they formed their little um, Pieds Noir communities. You can still see, see their websites, um, and they, they keep the cause going, and then they're lost. Now, I knew a woman who was married to a South African diplomat who was in France, the South African consulate in, in, in um, southern France in the 1980s, and she said she met these Pieds Noirs, who'd spent some time in Algeria, in some cases, generations, and they were often deeply sympathetic to South Africa, um, even though a lot of French people were very against the apartheid regime and said it's uh, le régime fasciste. And the Pironna said, oh no, it's the same thing because we are the civilized minority and it must be run for our basis and it still benefits the um, indigenous people. Um, so Les Pionnois were fairly unpopular. When the conflict had erupted in 1958, everyone except the communists wanted France to retain control of Algeria. I don't think most Algerians do. There had been some sort of peace plan actually earlier on, which I think they'd had a referendum in Algeria and most people voted for it, but it hadn't worked and that conflict had, had carried on. Um, anyway, uh, so, you know, the Socialist Party, they had said, no, let's fight on. It is a part of France, that's it. And that's why the French army was able to send conscripts there because French law said a conscript cannot be forced to serve outside France. He can be required to defend France, but not, not to serve in foreign war because of this, um, this uh, legal claim that Algeria was part of France. These um, men who were called up for compulsory military service could be sent to France. The draft, some of them having completed their two years in the army in, in France or wherever it was, and then they were released to civilian life. But the army was so short of men because the Algerian conflict was such a large scale, they were recalled to military service. And um, then that became um, deeply unpopular. So it was just um, an intractable war. It was costing a lot in blood and lives. So um, uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed in Algeria, a great number of them Algerians. Now, in these irregular conflicts, um, so the security forces don't tend to behave impeccably. But um, it's fair to say that the record of the French military and police was, was bad 
in Algeria in terms of human rights abuses. No army or no police force is going to be perfect in the situation. I realize that. I take that into account. But uh, you would expect better from France, which boasts it's the land that in in invented human rights. Say, well, you know, we need to find where the hidden men are or where the bombs are hidden. We're going to torture these suspects and we're, we're, we're going to kill civilians deliberately. And I know the FLN was playing at the same game. So it was horrific. You should read about it. Savage War of Peace. I can't remember who it's by. The, the French, uh, sorry, the British consul in Al Algiers, when it was still a French colony, Christopher Hewitt Biggs, um, some of the Les Pianois loathed him and thought that he was encouraging France to grant independence to Algeria. They uh, planned to assassinate him. Didn't happen, actually. Instead, he was assassinated by the IRA in about 1975 when he moved to Dublin. Um, so Algeria became independent, and um, some of the Algerians were elated. Um, and the Algerian flag had been banned for a long time. Hello there, Robin Holiday. Greetings to you. Um, so it became a military dictatorship. Uh, the country didn't develop it much economically. Most people lived in terrible penury. There was this kleptocracy. That generation who um, led the country to independence in 1962, they remained in office almost to this current day. Um, Boutouflika, if I remember his name correctly, that diminutive old chap who's only just retired. And they, they fell out amongst themselves, the um, Algerian leadership. Um, some of them were imprisoned for life, who'd fallen out with the president. Um, there's a lot of emigration, ironically, to France. And when Jacques Chirac visited around about 2000, a lot of Algerians said him visa, visas, and they wanted a visa to go and work in France. Sometimes to complain they still face racism in France. There were some Algerians in France during, um, during this uh, rebellion in the 50s, and they had a big rebellion, they had a big demonstration by the banks of the Seine in Paris, and they were severely beaten up by the French police and several of them killed. Maurice Papon was uh, head of the Paris police at the time. Papon, who was later sent to prison for life for crimes against humanity. In, in, in the Second World War, he'd been a vichyviste, and he'd um, authorized the, the uh, torture and execution of lots of resistance fighters. But anyway, you can see a memorial uh, in Paris by the banks of the River Seine to the Algerians who were killed for peaceful protest in Paris. I said, like, tu es pendant la sanglante répression d'une manifestation, killed during the bloody repression of a demonstration. Um, so that was that. It remained as a military dictatorship. Um, there was growing unrest, a population explosion. Another issue was Arabic, the unofficial language. The Berber minority felt discriminated against. Um, and even though French has no official status, it's used a lot in education and business, particularly in the big cities. Um, don't want to talk, talk too much about uh, contemporary Algeria. That's beyond the remit of this video. Um, there's a little bit of oil there, but the wealth is very unevenly distributed. And then um, in about, hello there, hi, Colin, Kenny. About 1992, um, the military junta announced very sad any form of discrimination. Yes, I know, it's detestable. The military dictatorship allowed there be, said there'd be elections. And they, they were secularists, these military officers. They were Muslims almost to a man. The Jewish community and the Christian community almost all left. Um, but they said, you know, we do not have a Sharia state. You can wear what you want, you can eat what you want, you can drink what you want, things like that. We're not imposing that. A man can only have one wife. The law of the land is not influenced by the Quran. But there was a group called, um, uh, there was Islamic Salvation Front, like um, Front de la Salvation Islamique. Um, and they said, um, a new political party because um, political parties were banned, first of all, but they used to meet in the mosque, say, we want a Shariat state, but also welfare. We hate uh, these um, uh, thieves who rule us and brutalize us. And that struck a chord with the average Algerian. Even someone who's not particularly religious said that, that yes, that, that is better. And it's outrageous that we, uh, we defeated the French only to be oppressed by our own uh, army officers. So elections were called for 1992. And the um, FIS, they accepted um, democracy once one election, then they'd win, form the government and never hold an election again, and the constitution with the Quran and so on, and they'd close down loads of things like cinemas, because there'd be no casinos, no alcohol, women would have to wear hijab, more than one wife for a man if you want to, you know, homosexuality would be punished by death, loads of things uh, w w would change. Anything at all racy couldn't be imported, obviously no alcohol, halal meat only, forcible fasting at Ramadan, prayer call everywhere, religious indoctrination in schools. Um, so they, uh, but anyway, the army realized that the FIS was going to win, so they canceled the elections and the conflict began. The FIS formed its own armed wing, Groupe Islamique Armée, the armed Islamic group. Now, 
we often hear in Western countries like France and the United States promoting democracy, but not in Algeria, because they knew the um, um, FIS was going to win. Um, partly because some people agree with that religious agenda. Some people are religious conservatives. And you might say, well, democracy is majority rules. If the majority wants something that you find unacceptable, tough. You're going to have to live with it. They're allowed, they're allowed to do that. You can't annul an election just because you don't like the outcome, that I don't like the way you vote, therefore your vote doesn't count. No. Um, whether it brings to office a government you like or you loathe, you have to accept the result. And so the GIA began fighting against the Algerian army anyway, and it was really it was back to the 50s insofar as um, uh, a very large-scale conflict. And ironically, it's the, um, the um, military dictatorship was, was for the forces of the Enlightenment. And yeah, there were lots of atrocities on both sides. And so many Algerians left, partly because the economy was stagnant anyway, the population was growing up, but, and, and, and it was increasing rapidly. And obviously the economy was going down the pan because uh, of the conflict. Who was going to invest there? You'd get out if you could. And many of the most educated and intelligent people were the ones who were most likely to leave, had most more opportunity to leave, and they didn't like either side in this civil war. And France gave its unstinting backing to the military dictatorship because they really don't want this sort of uh, uh, these religious reactions ruling Algeria. There's a significant Algerian community in France. Many of them are French citizens now. Some of them have been there for a few generations. Some of them very integrated, some of them very isolated from mainstream French society. But because France was funding and backing the Algerian government and, and providing intelligence, then the um, GIA said, all right, well, we'll take the war to your patch and started setting off bombs in France, including on the Paris metro. They, they didn't manage to kill many people. The conflict was simmering down. Then George W. Bush came along, and despite his preaching democracy, he was like also full four square behind the Algerian military dictatorship because he said, well, however bad they are, the opposite are more or less like Al-Qaeda, so I have to back them, and indeed he did. Um, and there have been peace talks, and it sputtered on and on. The conflict is not as bad as it was. Occasionally it's back into the headlines where they kidnap foreign oil workers or the GIA. There were some Christian priests who'd stayed on in Algeria, even though there was no Christians to minister to, and they'd all been kidnapped and beheaded, things like that. So that's the Algerian situation, not a terribly happy situation. Would it have been better if they'd stayed with France? Well, just possibly. They didn't want to stay with France. I don't think there's much doubt about that. But um, the Algerians felt they weren't terribly well treated by, by the French, um, and they, they weren't allowed equality. If the French had changed that, it might have been different. Um, they might have uh, wanted, wanted to accept it. Um, so there we are. That's a little bit about um, um, the independence of um, Algeria. So because, you know, France had, had in the late 50s accepted all our colonies can go independent except Algeria because it's not a colony. It's part of metropolitan France because it had three million um, French citizens there. Um, they were still only a minority. If France had kept a bit of it, just some of the coastal cities, that might have been doable, not the whole country. Okay, I'm signing off now. I need uh, financial support to keep this going, so uh, please dig deep. I know you're going to show your munificence donating to me on Patreon or possibly on um, PayPal. I teach people lessons on time. Oh, many thank you, Diane. Just let me know when you do. And uh, uh, it, can be, it can be a six-figure sum if you include the numbers after the decimal point. Um, and I also am a tour guide in London. If you're coming to London as a tourist, look me up and I give you a superb guided tour. That's all. Goodbye.